Well, good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. We'd ask everyone in the um, gallery to turn all devices to silent, if they're still on, please. And we have <coughs> item one on the agenda as a decision by the committee to take items three, four, five and six in private. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, we turn now to item two in the agenda, which is our consideration of the Scottish National Investment Bank Bill. And for our first panel, we have um, today Professor Lynn Cadenhead, who is the Chair of Women's Enterprise Scotland, so welcome to you. Then Linda Hanna, who is Managing Director of Scottish Economic Development at Scottish Enterprise, again welcome to you. And finally, David Alexander, who is the Chief Executive and Co-Founder of Midex CIC, so welcome to you. Good morning. And um, just for those who may not have given evidence before, the sound desk will operate the mic, so there's no need to press any buttons. And if you want to come in, simply indicate but with your hand if you're wanting to come in on a question as the discussion develops. Now, um, perhaps I could start just with a question about some of the submissions that we received and um, the view in expressed in them that the... Um, the broad mandate set out by the bill in the bank's main and ancillary objects fails to enshrine either the Scottish Government's vision for the bank as set out in its implementation plan or the socio-economic and environmental objectives that were expected from the consultation process. So I'm just wondering if um, the witnesses would share that view expressed by some of those who responded to the consultation paper, or are they satisfied with the objects uh, uh, as set out, or do they think they are somewhat vague and open to interpretation? Um, who would like to comment first? Happy David start. Alexander? Um, we think there is a missed opportunity in the objects at this point in time. Uh, the vision was very clearly set out, and unfortunately, <coughs> as you see in many walks of life, um, sometimes plans and vision are not implemented so you miss the opportunity and I think the objects need to be tightened and made more explicit about what it's intending otherwise I think it leaves it open uh, to failure to achieve its mission and its vision um, I've got some thoughts on what that should say um, if the uh, committee would be interested um, do, do you want to just <coughs> give us a, an indication of what these are? I mean, any witness can obviously write sure. into the committee if you want to add to your evidence afterwards. I, I think it's very straightforward. The main object of the bank should be to provide capital, including long-term patient capital, uh, to enterprises supporting and enabling the achievement of the mission set by the ministers to achieve sustainable, inclusive and social economic benefits. And at the moment, I don't think it's doing that. I don't think it's saying that. I don't think it's supporting that. And what we mean by patient capital is equity investments as well as loans. There's enough commercial loan market out there at the moment, but we're talking about significant infrastructure investments, both in the digital economy and also the physical economy as well. And it, the Scottish National Investment Bank is a massive opportunity to underpin and support that. But it's not there in the bill at the moment. All right. Um, do our other... Panel members have comments on this? I would say there's a, a general sense within the, the early stage investment community there's a little lack of clarity at this point in time in terms of uh, what the bank is uh, proposing to do. And we are particularly concerned about uh, the bank's ability to find to, to give funding for females in business. Um, having a focused opportunity in terms of funding female entrepreneurs. Um, we are in discussions uh, with people in, within the Scottish National Investment Bank at the moment, and they're very open and willing to, to receive further conversations, but still a little bit of work to do there. Linda Hanna? Yes, just, just to add to that, um, convener. So I think certainly from our perspective, in terms of what the bank has been set up to do, in terms of what's you know in terms of what's required in the economy right now, um, we can see that this is going to add to what needs to be done. And certainly in terms of the objects that are there, in terms of inclusive and economic sustainable growth, the, the focus on being able to look at getting more finance into the system, we believe is absolutely needed and is going to help um, achieve some of the ambitions that we've got in the economy. And we think certainly to 
in terms of the way that's set out, it does give a clarity on that, but there is also some flexibility, I think, in terms of over a long period of time which the bank is going to be set up over to be able to attune that to the needs of the economy as it's required. All right, I'll move on now to Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. My first question is in relation to the demand for the finance uh, to be provided by the bank. Uh, we've seen from other policy initiatives, for example, the Scottish Growth Scheme, that there wasn't sufficient demand from business in Scotland to uptake the, the finance. I'd like to get the panel's views on whether there's enough underlying demand in the economy for a significant level of finance to be provided by the bank. And secondly, perhaps for Linda Hanna, what steps will Scottish Enterprise take, what different approach will Scottish Enterprise take to stimulate that additional demand in the economy? Um, I think there's an overwhelming demand in the market for the Scottish National Investment Bank and finance. The issue is, at the moment, as it's currently envisaged, it's not the right type of finance. We need patient capital. That's not five years, loans underpinned by uh, a commercial rate of interest. It's long-term equity investment, long-term loans, convertible loan notes that can take equity, that can deliver back to the Scottish National Investment Bank significant returns through dividends. We're a community interest company. We've been around 12 years. We've pretty much funded ourselves through social investment. We have tried to raise capital for what we deal with, which is infrastructure projects to try and improve public service, remove form filling, ensure inclusion, and work with people. And it's incredibly challenging. Scottish governments led the way on these programmes to try and improve the lot of the Scottish citizens and improve public services. CivTech is a really good example, the Can Do Challenge, etc. They are really positive initiatives in Scotland, but the type of funding we need to equip the whole of Scotland with the infrastructure necessary to remove form filling and remove risk from delivering public services and strip out 45 to 90 per cent of the operating costs of delivering it is not there because everybody wants to lend you money for three to five years. Nobody wants to make investments or provide patient capital, proper patient capital. So I think if you constitute the bank correctly and offer that sort of funding, you will have an overwhelming demand. People who want to pay it back, we're a CIC, we want to make returns and deliver dividends back. We're not asking for a handout. We're just running infrastructure projects and trying to change the way the economy works. Okay. Absolutely agree uh, with David. Uh, there's significant demand for finance. In fact, uh, when we talk to female entrepreneurs, uh, barriers in terms of access to finance is the most significant uh, problem that they face. Um, it's the type of finance, it's the, the patient capital, and it's also looking at uh, developing different kind of opportunities for funding which are more appropriate for female-led businesses. For example, uh, looking at loans that have uh, childcare breaks in them and also opportunities to overcome the problems in terms of you know, having to grant security um, against any loans, um, putting a family home down as security is a step too far for a female entrepreneur. So it's looking at the type of money that's available. All our research shows there's significant demand from female-led businesses and significant ambition in terms of wanting to grow. So just to add to that, so from a Scottish enterprise perspective, um, we do see demand. So certainly we obviously run Scottish Investment Bank currently. And in terms of the portfolio we have, then we, we're seeing, you know, fairly healthy um, pipeline coming forward for um, the different uh, funds that we currently have, both in terms of kind of loans and equity. Um, as part of, um, we know in terms of the SEGCP, so the Scottish European um, Co-Investment Fund that we run, um, that's had a slower start. So, so we know that in terms of switching some new things on, particularly at scale, can be more challenging. But given this is about patient capital, I, I do think it's about learning from that and what does that look like. We've done three deals now through that scheme and that's telling us that there is a market for that, but we do need to make 
future they'll be, they'll be switched that on. So we believe that this, the bank is ambitious, but it's achievable. We believe it's what the economy needs, and that additional 200 million over 10 years will absolutely give the opportunity, I think, to look at different routes to funding, uh, as uh, Lynn and David have said, but also to make sure that we think about how do we switch on parts of the market that maybe the current product offering is maybe not serving in the way that it needs to in the future. Um, in terms of your question about demand, um, I think for Scottish Enterprise, what we see the opportunity of the bank is not just about the 200 million, and I know that's what everybody kind of often talks about, but it's a moment in time that we see this absolutely as a catalyst. The system being able to, there's already work going on on the back of the enterprise and skills review to look at how is the system working more effectively, how does the ecosystem work, not just in the public sector, but with the private sector and social enterprises and third sector. So this is an opportunity, I think, as a catalyst to use Scottish National Investment Bank coming on stream and to look at how the whole system works and then drive demand in that way. I'm happy to give some further examples of how we will be, we are already looking at stimulating demand and we're looking to do that in the future, if that would be helpful this morning or to kind of send that in. Uh, actually, that was you anticipated my next question, uh, because the evidence we've heard from the bank is that they, they will not act as the originator of, of funding opportunities. They will provide the funding and it will be up for other agencies to stimulate demand and find businesses for financing, which largely will fall to Scottish Enterprise and others. So I guess your, your question uh, anticipated my, my question, which was what, what reforms uh, will Scottish Enterprise uh, make to... to stimulate extra funding and will you need more staff and will you need a higher budget to achieve this? So in terms of the work we've been looking at, and we're working very closely with our colleagues in the government who are setting up Scottish National Investment Bank, and I should say that up front, a very close working relationship around setting up of the bank and how the transition, very much a, a team approach in terms of how we're doing that, not only with SE but with other partners, and I can see that. So the work that we're doing, looking at what is it going to take around developing that pipeline. So some things that we're already putting in place, if I give an example around the work that we're doing in manufacturing, so um, Scottish Enterprise, on behalf of the government, We've been leading the work around the Manufacturing Action Plan that the First Minister launched a number of years ago. Um, National Manufacturing Institute will be coming on, scheme, on stream. But what we've also, um, in the process of doing, is setting up the Advanced Man Manufacturing Challenge Fund, which will be helping regionally to provide facilities and capabilities for businesses to be um, able to take advantage of new, new kind of techniques around manufacturing, what would that look like? And what we believe that will do then is, as businesses get ready, it will drive demand then to where is the finance going to be, either for the capital investment, taking on people, or what would that look like? So as an example, there are things that are going to be in place that we will be investing in, and then, hope, and then working with those businesses to then drive demand towards the bank and help them get ready. Financial readiness scheme that we already operate, um, we, that will stay with Scottish Enterprise. 50% uh, of what comes through that comes from the work that we do with companies. 50% comes through other routes, um, through Business Gateway, through our website, etc. So what we're looking to do is to make sure that that financial readiness work that we do is even more fit for purpose in terms of using online services, in terms of making sure that that is in the places where the businesses will be. So making sure that that is you know, on the ground in regions and in the cities in terms of the work that we need to be doing. Um, and of course, we'll be working very closely with the South of Scotland and Highlands and Islands Enterprise about making sure that we do that. So that demand piece around how do we work with businesses uh, that we currently do? How do we switch on other businesses and make sure that the support's there to help them get ready? We're absolutely committed to do. That might take more resource, we don't know that yet, but we're working our way through that. We're also looking at how we make sure that for all of our staff, that that whole kind of um, sales force, if you like, of all of the people we have working with partners and with businesses have got that kind of commercial mindset about what would a good deal look like to make sure as that's driven towards Scottish National Investment Bank to do the transaction, that they know what that deal would look like. So those are a number of things that we're looking to do, and I've got kind of other examples as well, but I don't want to take up too much of the Thank you. Andrew wanted to just come back in briefly. Yeah, I completely support what has been said, but I would also make a, a, an absolutely fundamental point. Clarity that the private sector includes third sector, includes community interest companies and social enterprises who may want to be able to apply for investment funding, notwithstanding the point I've made earlier about patient capital. The minute you make it clear that the private sector is not 
just commercial companies there for profit, but mission-led organisations, organisations that are trying to deliver services that need financing, you will see a massive increase of demand. And there are umpteen bodies in Scotland, Social Enterprise Scotland, uh, Scottish Council of Voluntary Organisations, any number of organisations that the minute they realise that the Scottish National Investment Bank can support the members' organisations, you will see an increase of demand. And I would suggest that that will increase the demand for resource to process those applications and the, the information about how to apply. But at the moment, it's completely ambiguous. It talks commercial, it talks private sector, and we've heard on the evidence on the 14th of May that there's some ambiguity and people are not sure if uh, community interest companies like ourselves, who are asset and mission locked, but we're also limited by shares, uh, could apply. And uh, we see this as a massive opportunity in clarifying the purpose and mission of the bank. Just one final question for Linda Hanna, if I may, and thank you for your uh, answer. Uh, it seems to me that other uh, witnesses have said that there will be a, 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 an expanded role for the enterprise agencies to play here in delivering uh, funding opportunities to the bank. Um, I was interested in your comment that this might result in more staffing. Um, what about budget? Do, do you expect to see Scottish Enterprises' budget increase in the years ahead to accommodate this uh, uh, higher workload? So we haven't looked to that in terms of that far ahead. We're just about to launch our strategic framework for this year in a business plan, and we've set out what our plans are. We haven't yet had those conversations. We're still working through what the kind of future would look like, and be happy to come back to this committee and kind of talk about that once we're clear about what those things those things would look like. Okay. Thank you, um, Jamie Halker Johnson, and then uh, briefly, and then Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, Convening. Good morning to the panel. Um, what, one of the areas that it's been suggested that the new bank can have. Um, uh, uh, more of a role is in providing business support and advice uh, that's currently provided by Scottish Enterprise and also by um, Highlands and Islands Enterprise. So I was just wondering how you feel that that um, uh, regional knowledge, particularly for my area for the Highlands and Islands, will be maintained within the bank if those, some of those responsibilities have been taken over by them. Linda Hamm. Yep, I'll pick that Sorry. up. Um, so. Um, so what we certainly see is that this is a system, and if this is going to add the additional benefit to the economy, then it absolutely has to be about an ecosystem working. And both the implementation plan and the conversations we've had with the government and with the SNIB team absolutely underline that. Um, and that includes South Scotland, it includes Highlands Isles Enterprise, it includes others actually that are actors in this space as well, so it's not just about us. And actually the work around the Enterprise and Skills Review to create a digital entry point and the, the services that go around access to the services, we we see, and we've been talking to, to um, colleagues in SNIB, would ve very much be able to take advantage of that. So, so we don't see this as something that's going to, um, as, as I would kind of say, move stuff around that doesn't actually add additional benefit. We, the agency is particularly very good on the ground at working with businesses, very good at working with customers. And it's not a kind of a handoff process. It's about making sure we understand those companies' needs what wraparound support they need. Part of that will come from Scottish National Investment Bank, but that won't be the only support they need. And certainly all of our evaluation in the time that SIP has sat within Scottish Enterprise tells us that it's the package of support that matters. It's the kind of often the kind of combination of things they do and the sequencing of that that matters. So that customer experience is incredibly important and we all recognise that. So I would expect that to continue. I would expect us, us to be working hand in glove um, because we have to be, because the lines need to be short for the customer around how they navigate through the system and it needs to be seamless in that sense. So from that perspective, I, I am confident just in terms of the conversations we're having, it is about joining that up. Um, and that the implementation plan talks about making sure that those business support services are integrated in that way and about making sure we can use the expertise in the bank, which will be very deep around equity and loan and financial instruments. And the business support advice that we have will be very deep in our capability, and it's how we join those things up. Can I just come back? Because, I mean, I, what you're suggesting is that you're confident that that won't be diminished. Uh, in that possibly it could even be enhanced. I mean, one of the things that we had with the business support inquiry was whether uh, the enterprise body and, say, local local authority business gateway were coordinated. So you're confident that that coordination would be better there than it has perhaps been in, in other instances. <coughs> I appreciate that's not Highlands and Islands isn't your area, but... Yeah, so, so I'm an optimist. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> confident that... A combination of things are happening right now. So I, get, I know that you're scrutinising the SNIB bill today, but I think there's a combination of things going on in Scotland that are important. So on the back of the Enterprise and Skills Review, 
the work that is being done with Business Gateway, Scottish Enterprise, High and others, the work of the Strategic Board, is looking to rationalise and simplify, is looking to make sure that the access is better, is looking to use digital technology in a different way. So what I think what I'm saying is a combination of those things coming together will be really important and that it's not just it's about the whole system working and what we are working very hard, all of us, I don't just mean Scottish Enterprise, to do is to make that real. Um, and I see, so I'm confident because I see a reality in the expectations of Scottish Government of those things, of the people like me and my colleagues and other agencies to make that work. And, and I think it's that that will help to make sure that that continues to make sure that we can deliver both the business services that business needs and then connect that into new instruments like SNP. And you're also... Right. Sorry, Sorry, can I just... Well, well briefly, perhaps. And, and you're already looking at ways to evaluate that going forward and how that how that relationship is working? We uh, we haven't yet put in... A, sorry, I'm not aware that we've put an evaluation in place yet to do all of that. OK, thank you. Um, just very briefly, perhaps from David Alexander, I'm conscious of time that a number of committee members would like to come in and also, obviously... Um, I can certainly send a lot more, more information on this, but I would be deeply concerned. Um, we already see from the analysis we do working on the front line with 14 clusters across Scotland at least five to six overlapping initiatives in each local cluster, uh, many of the same organisations involved. That is where the targeted advice and support should be made available and be delivered consistently. Yes, integrate with the SNB, but I would be very worried about trying to centralise that kind of support. Yes, there's got to be contact points, joining the dots. Otherwise, we've got this Venn diagram on steroids of everybody all trying to provide advice. I think it's a real risk because each of the communities we work in is different. They've got similar themes, Community Empowerment Act, local implementation plans, health and social care partnerships, integrated joint boards. Constant turmoil and change is the only constant we find out there. And what we're trying to do is help transform that. And if another initiative means it's got to go to the centre, I think you'll have a problem. Right, I've come to Jackie Bailey now. I think I'll appropriate the phrase Venn diagram on steroids. I quite like that, convener. Um, can I turn us back to something that David Alexander raised earlier? And this suggestion, which was contained in the financial memorandum, um, of lending solely to the private sector. Now, my view is that is certainly against the spirit of the implementation plan. Um, and I wonder whether the panel believe that restricting spending in that, that borrowing in that way, um, you know, it, and not having it open to the third sector or community enterprises is perhaps a little short-sighted. I would absolutely agree with that statement. Uh, what's different about a community interest company? We're limited by shares. Uh, we decided to be mission and asset lock because we want to deliver transformation and change in how services are delivered and how citizens are empowered. We need capital to make that happen. We're delivering services. We work across public sector, private sector, and third sector. But we need funding. Why are we any different? Why should a community interest company, because it's decided to commit itself to a social purpose, be treated differently than somebody who says, I'm only here to make money for my shareholders, and that will be my profit imperative? And it's, you know, we see it all the time startups that look fantastic. There's so much money for startups that gets put in, and they get trade sailed off to a big commercial American organization. And there's no economic growth, there's no societal growth, no employment growth. And, you know, as much as that is needed and we want economy of growth here, we need to be supporting the third sector that's delivering significant chunks of public services, uh, delivering significant support to the Scottish population and is growing the economy. And um, social, social enterprises like community interest companies are designed specifically to help deal with intractable complex issues which need long-term commitment. Thank you. Um, again, I uh, agree with David. You know, so, for example, Women's Enterprise Scotland, we're a community interest company. You'll find that a lot of the enabling and supporting organisations that are helping our entrepreneurs and companies to grow you know, are social enterprises, community interest companies, and um, you know, funding, strategic um, you know, funding and investment should be ma made available to them as well. Linda Hanna. So, from a current perspective, um, Scottish Investment Bank, we, we do currently do um, investments into, a, I was going to say, not just kind of private limited companies, we, we do that in a range of things through the different schemes that we have. So, I, I think it is something to be explored just in terms of what does the word 
private mean? Because sometimes private means different things. Private could just mean it's not public sector. So private could mean a range of things. I, and I think there's, so I think it's worth kind of exploring just in terms of what does that look like. We already do community-based projects as part of the different schemes yeah. that we operate on behalf of the Scottish Government. But, but that's not currently spelt out. And my understanding for the reason for the restriction is the bank is initially only going to be resourced by financial transaction money. So clearly, if we are to take that wider approach, the expectation is that the government would put in other sources of funding that aren't restricted in the same way. Yeah, I'm yeah. assuming that to be the case. Um, can I come on, tease out the commercial side? Because um, I think um, David Alexander answered my next question already. But, but again, the wording within the financial memorandum talks about, um, and the bill states that the objective is to fund commercial activities. Again, I think terminology might be the issue here. There are many projects that have a societal or environmental benefit aren't necessarily for profit, which is implied by the term commercial activities. Would you want to see a tightening up of the language so that we can ensure that the broadest scope possible is taken? That's the definition of, you know, commercial in one world means one thing, commercial in another sure. world. I'll put it in a simple example. If by removing the need for form filling for citizens in Scotland in accessing public services could save 45% of the transaction cost mm -hmm. of a public service and therefore release money into frontline staff delivery, that's a commercial business case, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It means you can do more with less. At the moment, those things are not even being considered, but the vision of the bank was to help improve society and the economy. So we are constantly looking at removing friction, risk, effort and cost from transactions and services provided. We're a community interest company committed to doing that with a commitment to reinvest 65% of any surplus we make in that social purpose, empowering the people of Scotland. And I would ask people to think commercial is about making things better, faster, cheaper, more efficient and fairer. And I think that's the mission. Okay, that's helpful. Could I ask um, the, the other witnesses a slightly different question because um, if we want that kind of broader scope, therefore the limitation on, on borrowing posed by financial transaction money becomes unduly restrictive, um, do you think the bank should be able to issue bonds or public shares? Or should they only be able to borrow from Scottish ministers? Linda Hanna. So that's a matter for Scottish Government in terms of setting up Scottish National Investment Bank um, and I, so, but I think there's a broader piece just in terms of, I'm going to go back to the system, so I think Scottish National Investment Bank is part of the system and we need to think about it in that context. So in the context of some of the, um, the using financial transactions or loans that might be uh, less commercial, kind of in terms of the long term, I think there's an opportunity still to look at where does that sit best in the system and what's the best way for us to be doing that going forward and that's part of the conversations that, that we will certainly be having with Scottish National Investment Bank going forward. I suppose ultimately this is all a matter for the Scottish yeah. Government um, but, but what I'm kind of asking is if you were to give them professional advice, would you encourage them to leave it open so that they can issue bonds and public shares? It's not a matter I would give advice on. Um, it's, it's not my kind of deep expertise. Yeah, and I wouldn't feel appropriately qualified to comment on that either. I, okay. I would like to unequivocally yeah. say they should not. And Can I ask you why? That, absolutely, because the whole mission, vision and purpose of this bank is to improve Scotland. The minute you open it up to publicly traded shares and bonds being issued into the private sector market, you end up with the group think of the financial services sector uh, who are only wanting a return for their shareholders at commercial rates. They've got billions of pounds of opportunity to do that elsewhere. This is an opportunity to set out a vision for how Scotland can be treated. And there are other points in the bill about East, uh, state aid. There are many exceptions within state aid rules that allow the bank to exist and operate and move beyond. It's only 2021 mm -hmm. that that restriction applies. After that, you've got many other choices that you want to do. This could be a self-funding bank. If it gets it right, does equity investment, does long-term loans, it will build up its own asset base. And I know it's only $2 billion at the moment, and you say only $2 billion as if it's nothing, but it's a vast it's sum years. of money applied in the right way judiciously to solve complex issues. Uh, instead of just funding the private sector, uh, I think would be uh, a brilliant mission for it to have. Be different is what I would challenge the bank. Be different. 
Thank you, convener. John Mason. Yeah, if I could just uh, have a supplementary on that one to start with. Do you not think there'd be a lot of ordinary people in Scotland would like to put some of their savings into the Scottish National Investment Bank because they would feel it was good for the economy? I think that's a fabulous idea. We've seen national savings initiatives on many cases. If people got a guaranteed rate of return that was not as uh, a tr you know variable as it is in the private sector, I think there's a reason. There's a good opportunity there, but that's okay. different. Right, that's so you're, you're not against all outside finance, right? Saying, I mm. want to support the improvement of this country, and I'm happy to support the Scottish National Investment Bank that's got a very clear mission and purpose to do just that. Okay. It's going to feed back into my community, it's going to improve my infrastructure, and it's going to remove friction, risk, effort, and cost from my life. Okay, that, fine. So that was just to clarify that particular point, that's fine. Uh, my main uh, point was in question of the advisory group, which has been, we've had uh, various. Uh, concerns or, or um, evidence g given to us, or submissions made to us at least, uh, about the advisory group. I think some people feel it, it could get too involved in the uh, actual running of the bank if the link is too close. Other people feel it's going to be too far away and uh, maybe it should have a, a very fixed representation. Should there be trade union people on it? Should there be re people from different regions on it? All that kind of thing. So I'm interested in your general feelings about the advisory group and where you see that going. Anybody? <laughs> Mr. Alexander, look at me. Yep. I think there's a risk of groupthink. <coughs> I think you're drawing from too narrow a pool of people. A lot of them seem to be money people. I think you need representations from citizen groups. We work in Glasgow. They've got citizen activists. It's not as uh, terrifying as it might sound. They are really incredibly informed about the life in their communities, and I think each of the clusters has got citizen panels. I think people could come and represent. I think you've got organisations like Social Enterprise Scotland uh, that are doing an awful lot of good work that could contribute to it. I think it's not wholly a financial advisory group. It's about mission and purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's the other area where we need transparency and accountability for the bank. At the moment, it feels a little bit too arm's length from the Scottish Government. The, the goals and objectives have to be measurable, and the advisory group could also hold the governance uh, committee of the bank to order on that matter as well. So I think people are looking at outcomes and impact should be on that group as well. I mean, if I'm understanding you correctly, you said that there's a danger of group think, and it's just it's the advisory group is drawn from too narrow a range of people. Is yeah. there something in the bill or something in the financial memorandum that makes you think that? Uh, I I don't think that the mission, the measurements, and the accountability is strong enough for the bank to report back to ministers. I think the advisory group has got a danger of drawing from too narrow a field of people. What? what sorry, why? Because they're going to look at it as a financial institution and not as right, a so, much okay, broader right. institution right. that is meant to be delivering the mission and vision of the bank on behalf of the Scottish ministers and on behalf of the Scottish people. And someone's got to hold it to account. And they, you know, performance must be linked to achievement of the vision and the mission. Right. OK, thanks. Uh, Ms. Uh, Professor Kidnett. It, it very much depends on the role of the group and the makeup of the group. I mean, if you're looking at the bank as having its, you know, chair and its chief executive and its, you know, non-executive directors at the moment, the advisory group um, I would be seeing as drawing kind of intelligence from the community, uh, you know, bringing diversity of thought through the makeup of the people that are on that board, and in particular, obviously, diversity of thought from a gendered uh, basis, but diversity of thought from a, a social social background basis as well, uh, and an age uh, demographic. So it really depends on what you want the role of the advisory group to to do, and how it's how it's constituted and how it's governed. I mean, if say the chair of the advisory group was also on the board of the bank, would that make it too close a relationship? Would that lead to a conflict of interest? Uh, I would say it probably does because it's simply an advisory group and it's there to give advice and it's up to the board whether or not it takes that, takes that advice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ms Hannah, did you want to say anything? So I think the advisory group is really important um, in, in the context. This is a long-term play, so you know, at least 10 years. So, and the missions have still to be identified over time, what they're going to be look like. So the advisory group has a real opportunity to bring that kind of diversity of thinking um, and different people on that over time. So you can get people coming in and out of that, I think, as the bank is kind of moving. So the governance is the governance, but the advisory group, I think, is able to bring some independent thought, some um, real depth of expertise, 
some uh, kind of research and kind of where thinking is, be, is happening elsewhere. And that, I think, conflicts with where the bank is going, separate from the government side. I do think it's quite an important part of um, the construct of the bank and about being able to use that in terms of reflecting uh, progress that will come back in terms of the strategic framework and how the bank is doing, but also progress in terms of where the bank is wanting to go in the economy. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks so much. And if I can move on to a different subject, which is some of the financial implications. Uh, that We've had, again, different evidence, for example, how quickly we would expect the bank to break even. Um, if we're talking about patient capital, that suggests quite a long time, but the, the, the suggestion is the bank should break even fairly quickly. Um, and the, I think the Royal Society of Edinburgh were uneasy about that. And then also some of the costs involved um, Someone else will look at remuneration, so I don't want to touch on that, but just the general cost of the bank. And then also, I think the Scottish Government's going to have a sponsorship unit, which will link to the bank, and that's going to be a million a year. And, and again, there's been some suggestion that's a bit too much. So have you got an overall feeling as to the costs that are being projected? Are they too high, too low? Are they realistic? Anyone? Um, Mr Alexander. I I think there is a risk always with any new institution being formed of duplication of effort and overlap. And I would commend the Parliament to look at other service providers that already exist that could perform many of the functions of the bank in Scotland today. So rather than create a whole new institution, it's actually think of it very much as a virtual organisation. That is very much the way of the world at this point in time. And I think using existing service providers that are in Scotland to underpin many of the operational delivery components would be a good thing. We've got um, uh, Social Enterprise Scotland and any number of other bodies could, could be delivering some of the back office services potentially. Um, my big worry is that the time scale over which a return on investment must be made and it to be self-sustaining is completely unrealistic and it will drive it down a path of commercial loan making uh, and, and try to compete with the commercial market. This is meant to be different. And I think we should be committing ourselves to a long-term programme which ultimately delivers money back into the Scottish economy and the Scottish Government and it becomes self-funding. But it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and could you put a timescale on what is realistic? Well, I think if it was break-even in 15 years, you'd be happy. I know that may be blasphemous, but I think in reality it should be delivering returns within 15 years. I mean, do you think it would be possible for the politicians just to sit in here for 10 years? That's two parliamentary terms. I, I know how terrifying that is uh, in political and economic terms, but it's meant to be the Scottish National Investment Bank. Okay. If you look at the multi-billion pound investments that are made in infrastructure, none, no one asks the question, does it pay it back in three years or five years? Okay. We are talking about a Scottish National Investment Bank. It's meant to transform the economy. It's meant to transform civil society. That will not happen overnight. We're constantly faced with people trying to rewire the building with the power still switched on. That's the transformation that is underway. And it will not get done in three years. We've got endless reports, haven't we? We see it all the time with our cluster profiles. Millions and millions of pounds put into reports describing the problem, nothing put into implementation. And then you're on to the next plan or the uh, landscape review or the, the next project to review why the last one didn't succeed. We've just got to change our time horizons here. OK, that, that's very helpful. Thank you. Professor Cadenhead. I would say that the, the projections to break even within a couple of years are wildly ambitious. Um, if I look at, uh, for example, when we're working with early stage companies, uh, you usually take their projections and say it's going to take you twice as long, you're going to cost twice as much and you're going to make half as much money. And the same kind of sensitivity analysis can be pretty much applied to, to anything that's new. Again, if you look at, uh, you know, average, um, you know, time, time to exit from, from a startup company, you know, where, where, where funds will be returned, um, probably you're looking at seven years. Um, so if this bank is going to be investing in, in high risk, you know, high innovation companies as well, you're not going to start to get returns for a significant period of time. So I do think it's wildly ambitious. If you look at um, funding for, say, venture capital funds, they tend to work on a kind of 2 in 20 process, so a 2% management fee and a 20% carry. So, again, when I actually look at the costs that are involved with this, you know... So, 20% carry, can you just explain? Um, 
sort of, you know, benefit, you know, interest, um, money that comes back to the people right, in the okay. fund, you know, when they exit from the opportunities. Um, so if you look at, you know, the, the costs that are involved here, again, I think they're uh, pretty hefty. Okay, Miss Hannah, do you want to say anything on this? No. No, that's fine. Could I just add one thing? I run a community interest company limited by shares. We're on a 30-year mission. We're 12 years in. Mm -hmm. Who's helping me? On that mission to improve public service, improve the lives of people. But your, your board doesn't wait till after 30 years to ask if you failed or succeeded, do they? Do they not no, ask we're you constantly they... looking at the progress we make. And yes. some years we do incredibly well, and other years we have to fund it. Right. You know, it's a transformation program. We're working with uh, local authorities, third sector, private sector. It's transformation programs, and we constantly come up against people not facing the reality of what transformation of services looks like. Okay, Everybody I think wants that's it helpful. Tomorrow. I'm going to have to draw that hot out because I think other people want to ask questions. Gordon MacDonald. <clears throat> We've already touched upon this morning about whether the PLC route is the right vehicle for the new Scottish National Investment Bank. However, we also received evidence um, from Scottish Council for Development Industry, which says that um, it will allow the banks to raise capital from a range of public and private sources and that the Articles of Association will protect the ownership of the bank. And the STUC says, being established as a public limited company wholly owned by ministers ensures that the bank is publicly owned and privatisation would require primary legislation. Why do you think that another model is would be better than the PLC? Um, well, I think it's a slightly weird question. I personally believe that a community interest company model would be appropriate for the bank. Uh, that is an asset and mission locked bank. There's nothing to stop a community interest company becoming a PLC, but it's still a CIC. So I've got a more fundamental point to make about why you need a CIC structure, which is asset and mission locked. You've got to protect the mission of the bank. Mm -hmm. A PLC that slides into public ownership, even with a parliament that uh, has to vote on it, will drive it down a market forces route, which is an illusion. You must let market forces survive. This is meant to be an important lever in the, in the government's approach to improving Scotland, improving the economy and improving society. I think if you have a mission-locked bank then it protects it for the future. Also, you've got a massive benefit in a CIC. It has to reinvest 65% of any surplus it makes in its mission, which builds up the capital base it needs to continue investing. Mm -hmm. And if you intend to float it off and sell it to somebody else at some other point in time, if you float it off as a CIC, as a PLC, which is included in the community interest company regulations, it will protect that mission mm -hmm. lot, which means the only people that will invest in it who are people who are committed to the vision the worst thing, the travesty, would be if this Scottish National Investment Bank ended up as another privately owned bank as it slipped down the side and started being measured by purely commercial measures. But is there any evidence that that could happen? We've already got um, development banks in Scotland. We've got the Development Bank of Wales, which has been established for nearly 20 years. Yeah. We've got the British um, Business Bank. Both of them are PLCs. Why... Why have they not went down the CIC route? Uh, my personal view is that the understanding of what a community interest company has been very low, the regulations not been in place as long as a PLC. A PLC is a legal form that uh, a community interest company can have. I would say Scotland's got an opportunity to actually support the, the kick structure and have a plan to move it to, to a PLC. You're just It's a double protection for the mission and the assets of the bank. That's all I'm advocating. If you want to make it a PLC, but make it a CIC PLC, then it's all available off the shelf, terms and conditions, articles of association. So I'm just advocating that you think differently about the asset and mission lock. Okay. Anybody else get a view? It was just to add that certainly my understanding, although I've not looked at it, is that um, the team um, looked very deeply at different models. So you've mentioned too, there's other models in particularly Europe that they looked at, and they weighed those kind of... Um, factors up just in terms of you know what the bank is there to do and uh, what would be the best kind of construct for that and, and can it come up with this and I guess you know the kind of fundamentally about it being publicly accountable but being commercial and being able to generate a portfolio an evergreen portfolio mm -hmm. is those kind of combination of things but the research that they did certainly kind of led them to believe in terms of that direct line to ministers was absolutely the right model to do that. 
I'm, I'm a big fan of not reinventing the wheel. I'm a big fan of looking at what has happened in, in other countries. And as you say, it's been a model that's been adopted in a number of other countries. And there's ways and means to write protections into you know, articles, etc., cetera, to, to ensure that the bank delivers on what it's supposed to do. So on balance, uh, we would be saying that the PLC approach is the right one. OK, thanks very much. Andy Whiteman. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, first of all, just to follow up a question that John Mason asked about the advisory group, which is recommended in the implementation plan, but it's not provided for in the bill. Um, to the extent that you think an advisory group is a good idea, do you think it should be enshrined in the bill? Or, or do you have no view? I, I think it should be enshrined in the Articles of Association of, of the Bank. Putting it in the bill seems to separate it from the bank's existence. And I think the role of the advisory group should be defined as part of the Articles of Association of the Bank. So that the purpose of the advisory group though is to advise ministers, though it's not? Yeah, but I, I absolutely think that it has to have a relationship with the bank. And therefore, the bank has to acknowledge its existence. It cannot ignore it. It has to support its endeavours. It has to be transparent to support it. And therefore, if you put it in the bill because that's to make it official and legal part of the Minister's support network. But I also think it needs to be embedded in the Articles of Association. Otherwise, the bank has the opportunity to go, well, it's not really anything to do with us. OK. Any other views? Or? I think the, the feedback from people is that the advisory group will be uh, really important uh, for the Ministers. And because it is of such importance, um, probably it should be in the bill. OK. Um, on the question of the, the mission, um, Mariana Matsukata gave us evidence last week, and she was quite clear that the mission should be more central to the objects um, of the bank. So the, the objects are set out in Section 2 of the Bill um, are as they are, but the mission is talked about in Section 11, and the mission is something that ministers will set. Um, any changes to the objects would be subject to parliamentary approval, but the setting of the mission or any changes to the mission uh, is not subject to any parliamentary procedure uh, at all. So two questions. First of all, do you think the mission should be more central to the objects in Section 2? And secondly, do you think that missions that are set should be subject to parliamentary scrutiny? On the first question, more tightly associated with the objects, absolutely. As I said earlier, I think it feels like it's been lost. And I think the bill needs to absolutely embed in the objects the mission of the bank and make it absolutely crystal clear. So I'm not talking about the mission of the bank. I'm talking about mission-oriented finance, the various missions yes. that are set from time to time. Yes. Okay. And I'm absolutely convinced they should be in the objects as being an impl implicit part of the purpose of the bank. Okay. Um, on to the second matter. Um, I think so long as there is adequate parliamentary time given to the discussion of the mission, uh, then there is an opportunity for real debate to happen about what the mission should be, and that it, there would have it be an opportunity for it to survive Parliament, given the gentleman's point earlier about return on investment and timescales. I think if the bank is going to be dealing with intractable issues and supporting finance, I think it needs proper debate, and once those decisions are made, they have got to transcend Parliament. That may not please ministers, but I do think there's accountability for the mission, and otherwise it may end up uh, becoming a bit of a football. And I would, count, I would think it needs to be debated in Parliament. Okay, any other views? Certainly, in terms of the bill, in terms of the operational matters, I think the missions are set out in there, and I think that does set out what the, the bank is intending to do and gives flexibility just in terms of how those missions might turn change over time and about how they're going to be reported to the Parliament. So, so my question, however, is that the, the only obligation on ministers when they're setting the mission under Section 11 is to lay them before Parliament. There's no s scope for any debate. Parliament doesn't have to vote on them or anything like that. that my question is, should Parliament have a, a statutory role in scrutinising and approving the missions or not? I don't have a view on that. don't have a view, OK. No, neither do I. Okay, thanks. Um, the, Mr. Alexander, you talk about, in your evidence, um, you say that the, um, 
The Bill makes no requirement for the Bank to ever report to Ministers on how effective or efficient it has been in actually achieving uh, the missions. The only provision is for the Bank to report to Ministers on how it intends and, uh, to achieve the mission. And then you say this mission, this omission, <laughs> needs to be rectified. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, if you specified what the mission of the bank is and the performance of the, whether it be loans or equity, there's a whole set of business plan assumptions. I don't know any public, private or third sector organisation that does not have a scorecard, that does not report on its progress against its plans and demonstrates accountability against delivering what it said it would deliver. And we all know no plan survives implementation but there is acceptable tolerances. And if the mission of the bank is well laid out and the performance measures, key performance indicators are there, it should be possible to report against those. And the board and governing body of the bank should be held accountable for the performance against those. Okay, I'm just wondering, you make a very specific point though about the missions. We have provision in the bill for um, reporting on missions in section 12, it seems that that there may be some vagueness there, I, I grant you. There's section 13 on report and investment performance, there's section 14 review of performance, and of course the bank will have to provide annual reports and accounts. I'm just wondering if this is a, a really specific thing that needs to be rectified. Impact. Value, transformation, okay. mission achievement. Did we get there? Were the assumptions that we made and the money we invested, did it have an impact? Is the economy better? These are indirect impacts. It's not purely the loan book got us a load of interest that you know we've got we hold equity in a business, you know, should that be included? It's actually are the planning assumptions that were made about why we're supporting an organization to improve the Scottish economy, to improve society, they're indirect measures and the bank has to take responsibility for looking at those. There's got to be a way of measuring impact and value. So section 14 means every five years a person has to be appointed to carry out a review, which would include um, a review of performance, which would include the bank's uh, objects uh, and mission statement, uh, etc. Are you, are you just wanting some greater clarity on the specific missions in terms of the performance? Absolutely. I think there okay. needs to be a set of key performance indicators against the missions that the bank is responsible for tracking against. Okay and actually looking at if we're investing in these areas to improve the economy or society or remove friction or whatever the things that the, the mission of the bank is meant to support, what are those key performance indicators looking like over time? It, okay. I don't think it's acceptable to kick it off into a five-year review. I think the five-year <laughs> review should look at the trends okay. that are going on, but I think the measures are not there. And I wonder if the panel, just for interest, um, if you were a tasked with setting... Uh, a mission for the bank under section uh, 11. Can you give us an example of the kind of mission you would set? So, so an obvious one is around the kind of low carbon economy and certainly climate change. Um, it's something that we've been building, that we've been building quite a lot within Scotland collectively. And there's an opportunity just in terms of what's happening now, in terms of the global marketplace, the policy environment, um, and a number of the kind of capabilities that we've got, companies, universities, and other things that I think we could build on that in terms of really lifting that and accelerating it. So it won't surprise um, you to hear me say about inclusive growth. Um, I think we have to look look back at some of the start statistics at the moment um, in terms of you know female-led businesses. Um, if you look at Business Gateway, 50-50 gender balance of women starting up businesses. As they move through the growth pipeline, that moves down to about 20%. And then as they move into account managed companies at Scottish Enterprise, um, the numbers of female led businesses is around about 3.6%. Now, I do know there has been some more work that's been done on this, um, and the figures have improved. But whatever way you look at it, the statistics that we have for female led businesses uh, in Scotland are shockingly poor. Um, additionally, a very harsh statistic is that uh, one pence in every pound of venture capital investment goes to female-led businesses in the UK. One pence in every pound. And the bank has a significant opportunity to be able to transform funding opportunities for female-led businesses. Mine is far more mundane. 
I'm sorry, I completely support the point the lady's made, but I would like to remove the need for form filling in Scotland. I would like to equip every single citizen in Scotland with the ability to prove who they are, prove what they're entitled to, and never have to fill in a form again. OK. I think you can do that in Estonia, can you? Uh, not quite. Not quite. You're okay. dependent on the state. I'd like them to be independent. And that's okay. about a personal data infrastructure. Yep. OK, moving on to my second line of questioning, which is about around equalities. Uh, Professor Kittenhead, you just raised the question of, of, of women um, entrepreneurs. Equality is not mentioned in the bill. We've had evidence from Close the Gap and Engender um, that the Equality Impact Assessment is really not up to scratch. Now, the Equality Impact Assessment is a document the government has to produce, but it's not formally part of the documents that have to be laid in front of Parliament in relation to the, uh, the bill uh, itself. To what extent um, do you think that the... Uh, bank should have a mission to overcome inequality in its broader sense in Scotland? Um, I believe it's uh, essential uh, to create um, you know, a balanced society with diversity of thought, allowing everybody to be able to, to participate and contribute to, to economic growth. Uh, Close the Gap and Engender have done a really thorough analysis of the EQIA and I you know, broadly accept uh, all their recommendations. It needs to be enshrined uh, in, in the bill. This is really important. Where, where do you think it might be best enshrined in the bill in terms of the objects or performance or mission um, or can maybe come back with further thoughts on I'll that? I'll come back on, with further thoughts uh, on that but certainly we need to ensure that there's relevant KPIs uh, set and coming back to what David was talking about this is really all related to an annual impact report uh, reviewing it and looking at the trends over over time. We desperately need a gendered enterprise index in Scotland to be able to track the statistics and look at the data so that we can see ongoing trends. And the bank is one of the ways that, we, that can be helping with that. Any other thoughts? Um, I would ask you to consider the definition of equality for whom and for what. I think it's set out in the Equality Act. Yeah, I understand that, but I think there's not equality of access. Many people we know that are working in the third sector are women uh, and uh, people from all different sorts of minorities who are trying to set up social enterprises to do good. They will not have equal access in this current legislation for this bank because it's not supporting third sector and social enterprise. And assuming we can clarify that definition, then I think equality of access to what the bank represents would be a good thing. So I, putting it at a much broader level, if you broaden the access to what the bank can offer and you broaden it, it will support more diverse population of people because not everybody is trying to do a high-tech startup or a startup that they want to flip to sell to Google. There are a lot of people trying to transform services in this country that are more socially driven, uh, and they need funding and support. OK, thank you. Convener. Um, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Convener. Um, the bank is going to be, obviously, a public body, and it'll be accountable to taxpayers, and it will have to <laughs> evidence value for money. But it will also be working in the financial sector. Now, financial sector salaries tend to be fairly, fairly good in some cases fairly extravagant. Submissions that we've had to the committee on salary levels, wages, how it's going to be determined, uh, have varied quite a bit as to opinions. We obviously have to get the right people, or this isn't going to succeed. But does the right people equate to high salaries? I'd be interested to know what the, what the panel think. Uh, I think there's a flawed assumption that everybody's motivated by money. I've certainly worked in corporate life and had a very good lifestyle, but I got to a point in my life with a lifetime of experience that decided I needed to do something more. And I think if you specify the talents and the skills and the attitude of the person that you're looking for, you will find people with the necessary skills and ability to be part of the bank that are not being dragged out of the financial services sector and have got to be treated like gods. I really think what you've got to start with is the mission and the role and do a search on that basis. And you will find young and old talented people who want more and want to do something different. 
but they have the skills you need. So I would counsel against eye-watering salaries and bonus schemes and actually make a really positive statement about run the Scottish National Investment Bank for the people of Scotland, by the people of Scotland, and actually insist on talent, but make it plain you're not paying eye-watering pay. So we're relying on a degree of altruism in the no, market. No, it's not altruism, it's personal motivation. What drives mm. people? Not everybody is driven by money. I've done a lifetime coaching work with people and I can tell you there's a moment when people have just had enough of that and there's only so much they can have. And it's an illusion, the sort of masters of the universe finance sector model where everyone's got to be paid absolutely tons of money to turn up. You've got some fantastic public servants out there who are not paid eye-watering amounts of money doing fantastic work, people in the third sector. You can find the talent. And Scotland's got a lot to offer these people. So make your case for coming and doing something important. You will find them. Do the, the rest of the panel have a view? So, so I think it will be important to lay out exactly what, who is the bank, what's it for, what skills and expertise are going to be required. And like all financial services institutions, there's quite a lot of change going on just in terms of what that looks like. So I think there'll be a range of skills that the bank will need to employ to be able to do that. And some of that will be about delivering services and products and channels to market in a very different way than traditionally I think banks have done that. We see that already happening in the financial services sector. And I think SNIB will be no different. So I think there'll be a range of people from you know different kind of back backgrounds and skill sets. I think it's important to set out what skill sets are required. And then part of it's also then the values of the bank and attracting culturally the right people. So in terms of public good, I, I do think certainly our experience in Scottish Investment Bank, the people that we attract have those you know deep um, specialist skills, but they definitely are motivated about working in terms of a legacy for the economy and the difference that they make, as well as obviously the kind of individual transactions that they do. So I think it is about looking, setting that out in the right way, recruiting in the right way and bringing on those people. We've certainly found a way to do that within the public sector and as David said there's other examples I think where that can be achieved. Would you agree that uh, given the desire certainly on the panel's part for lending to also incorporate the third sector would you agree that that is a particular skill that not all uh, financial <coughs> experts have? Um, for example looking at a, most balance sheets uh, of third sector organisations they're not exactly bankable on the face of it. So would you agree we need we need to identify specialists in that field to be able to, to be able to adequately cope with that? I think it's people who genuinely understand what patient capital looks like and what the, the what the mission and purpose of the bank is. We've also seen in the social investment sector which uh, is effectively recycling uh, dormant bank accounts largely through big society capital, that they're taking commercial rates of return on loans for a short term, three and five years. They're not performing the role the Scottish National Investment Bank could provide. So even the people in the social investment space don't get it in terms of what the mission is. So you do need people that are able to look over the time horizon that extends beyond the parliament, that extends beyond normal commercial loan rates and actually look at the basic fabric of an organisation, its mission and purpose, and provide it with the, the type of patient capital that lets it execute its mission. Just uh, moving on to ethical investments, which is an important thing uh, for any uh, bank to deal with these days. Many investment banks and large pension funds have lending exclusions. It could be tobacco, for example, investing in tobacco companies. It could be Green, anything that in, investment that increases greenhouse gases or something that impacts negatively on biodiversity and the ecosystem. There's all sorts of formulas you can bring in. Should the bank go down that line? Should the National Investment Bank go down that line? Should it, should it be able to cater for that? I'm not answering as my desk because it's not really our department, but common sense is how I'd look at it. If the purpose of the Scottish National Investment Bank is to improve the economy and improve society, that anything that doesn't do that should not be invested in. But who will decide? Well, I think that is part of the un lack of clarity at this point in time. I, why would you support things that reduce public health? You know, but so, you would, I mean, you would have to have evidence. But isn't isn't that? the Scottish ministers to set the mission and say we do not want 
to support anything that reduces public health. Isn't, isn't it that isn't level? That, I think you would have to be very careful to keep it from becoming just a broad, you know, good idea to do yeah. to, to do that. You would have to specify particularly the types of investment that would be acceptable and those that wouldn't be acceptable if you're going to go down that line. Is that where they should be going? Uh, well, I don't know any investment bank or any kind of VC that doesn't have a portfolio rule book that says we only invest in certain things. If you're in the VC market, it's what makes us the most money at the fastest possible time and the biggest return. Scottish National Investment Bank is we want to improve. So if you want to put a block on certain investments, I think it's entirely within the remit of the ministers to do so. I don't know whether it goes into the bill. I, you know, I'm just giving you a personal opinion mm. here. But why would you back anything that made things worse? Do the rest of the panel have a view? You know, obviously, the ethical approach is the is the right way to go. You can take guidance from other organisations. It will be hard uh, to define that, you know, really uh, closely at the early stages. But I think we all have to to accept that you know some things we won't be able to do right at the start, and we have to have a bit of flexibility in terms of how the bank and what it does, you know, evolves over time. But um, you know, ethical is very much the way to go. And uh, we also see from a number of organisations that are investing into other funds, they are particularly asking for, you know, diversity and inclusion plans nowadays as well, before they will actually invest in <coughs> funds. So, you know, aside from the ethics, there's the diversity and inclusion plans as well that are important. Um, so, so what I can say is from Scottish Investment Bank, because we already run a portfolio, we do look at ethical considerations. We look at diversity, we look at inclusive growth, we look at progressive workplace practices of the companies that we're investing in or organisations. And we, we do also look at, depending on the fund, what some of the kind of restricted sectors are, what some of the ethical considerations are, um, and carry out diligence on, on that basis. Um, so, so that already exists um, because clearly we are part of the economic development landscape uh, as SNP will be. So I, I would expect those funds will be moving to, to SNP. So that practice we would anticipate will continue. Angela Constance. Thank you, convener. There is a number of very important work streams uh, that need to be done well. So we've got appointment of board members, strategic framework, ethical statement, for example. But we know that the timetable is pretty tight. So if the legislation passes, um, the bank has to be fully <coughs> operational by 2020. So I wondered if the panel had a view on whether, given the tight time scales, that the, the detailed work could be done in a quality way and whether that was achievable or not. As a person running many programmes and doing complex programmes over many years, I can tell you that coordination and communication are the two key components of success. The timescales are not unreasonable, but you'd have to accept that you're delivering incrementally over that period of time, and it requires really tight tracking. And that means everybody's involved has to have a common set of objectives. And there's a concept called objectives by key results that everybody is linked to. And if that type of model is approved and people are linked directly to those and that nobody's working as an island or a stovepipe, you can get there. But it will be challenging. A lot of public sector programmes and uh, public service programmes fall by the wayside because we get too involved in the structures and the processes and not the outcomes. And I think it needs really, really strong programme management by somebody committed to the mission as opposed to somebody who's being paid a large amount of money to be a programme manager. So it's all about how you set it up. OK, uh, Professor. So from, from my perspective, the um, it, it's tight, but it's doable. And the key thing is to get the recruitment of the board underway as fast as you possibly can. So recruiting the right chairman and recruiting the right chief executive and the right non-executive directors around that. If you get that team, they will drive everything else. So for me, the recruitment of the board is essential to be done quickly. Professor, did you say chairman? I did. <laughs> to strike that. <laughs> Chair. Yes, thank you. 
Miss Hannah, have you anything to ask? Dad? So at this point in time, I, I think with where we are and what we can see, and certainly I suppose I, I'm privileged around some of the work that's going on behind the scenes, I think there are lots of people working on this. So in terms of the programme of work, um, and, and David's kind of talked about programme management, but people really being committed to the mission of what we're actually seeking to do. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I think it is achievable, but it is going to require us to make sure that we keep focused on delivering those things um, at the right time. Okay, and uh, final question. Uh, do you think the bill does enough to ensure the bank's durability and survival across uh, political cycles? No. And I've already explained that I think it should be a kick. I think it's got an ability to fund itself. I think the Parliament should be involved in debating specific missions. Um, and I think this is one of those commitments that should be made that lasts many parliaments. It's not a science experiment, is it? It's a fundamental theory of change about how you improve Scotland. And it's audacious and exciting, but it needs protecting. OK, thank you. Um, Ms Hannah? So I, I think if, you know, the bill lays out what this is seeking to do, and Parliament will, you know, back that or not in, in that sense I think so this is about making sure that I think the bill sets out what we're seeking to do that we've then talked about all the other things that will come back to uh, ministers and set out in terms of reporting the strategic framework what the bank is doing I think it's those things that will demonstrate what it's doing on the ground and that's what will be enduring I think for the economy in Scotland. <coughs> okay thank you. Um, Professor? At the end of the day it will be judged on its results. Yeah. Okay thanks convener. I suppose, Professor, it could be a chairwoman or a chair or a chairman, depending <laughs> depending what the person thinks the position ought to be called or who they are. Um, I, I don't think we prescribe <laughs> language here in that sense. But uh, Andy Whiteman, we'll move on. Andy Whiteman. Sorry, I sh yes, I just wanted to follow up um, a point uh, Linda Hanna made about the Scottish Investment Bank. Um, it's a little unclear the extent to which the funds that are devoted to that will be rolled into the Scottish National Investment Bank because it seems to me that they're two very separate things. I mean, on your website, you talk about the companies that Scottish Investment Bank invest in. Uh, we invest alongside private sector investors into early stage and expanding companies with high growth potential that will deliver economic impact to Scotland. Now, clearly, there will be some companies uh, that uh, meet that definition that the SNIB might fund. But, for example, as I understand it, Scottish Investment Bank has invested in the Isle of Harris Distillery. I don't think Scottish National Investment Bank would be investing in the alcohol industry. Um, th these are very different things, aren't they? Long-term patient capital and your, your current investment bank that is about high-growth companies. So the current investment bank has a range of um, products, if you like, that, that we um, serve Scotland with in terms of those different stages, some of which are direct, some of which are co-invested, as you've said, some of which um, we, we seek to kind of crowd in other funding by, by um, us supporting things. Um, so all of those funds will transfer into the Scottish National Investment Bank, um, and therefore those mechanisms will continue to um, exist going forward. Well, but you, you, you support uh, an alcohol distillery, for example. I can't see uh, alcohol distilleries being central to the mission of the Scottish National Investment Bank. So if all those funds are rolled into the Scottish National Investment Bank, there'll be some loss of the kind of support that's currently provided to commercial activities, no? So I, 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 I can't comment on why the Scottish National Investment Bank so I can't comment in particular cases, but I think what we certainly look at is, in that case, you know, a company, in this case a distillery, the, the benefits it brings to the local community, uh, the jobs that it creates, the investment that's required, and the funds that we brought to the table to enable that to happen. Um, it'll be for Scottish National Investment Bank, once those funds transfer over, to look at how they manage that portfolio going forward. But you recognise those are two diff very different propositions, uh, an early start, high growth distillery? and the kind of projects that are mission orientated that are envisaged for the Scottish National Investment Bank? Yeah, so the Scottish National Investment Bank will do both. Um, so mission-based um, uh, uh, funding in terms of what that's looking to seek to do in the economy, but also support to uh, growth companies, early stage and later stage. Okay. And increasingly, I think, just in terms of the scale of the funding that might be required around companies um, as they're looking to seek more funding um, and some of the challenges that have been around that, I think we would expect the Scottish National, National Investment Bank will do more in that space. So you, you don't see anything that the Scottish Investment Bank is doing at the moment that couldn't um, potentially be done by Scottish National Investment Bank then? 
So I think where those are commercial deals, then I would expect that those will be done by Scottish National Investment okay, Bank. Okay, thanks. John Mason. Well, thank you. Just following up the previous line of question, I mean, can, can I confirm that you do not think alcohol is inherently a bad thing to invest in? And, you know, there are a huge number of jobs, huge amount of exports, and we absolutely should continue to invest in the alcohol industry. Would that be your feeling? So we, so the, uh, the distillery industry is really yes. important yes. to Scotland. It's a big part of our exports. It's a big part of our employment base. It's a big part of um, the innovation that we have in Scotland. Scottish Enterprise supports that, as does Scottish Investment Bank. So we support that in terms of the products we have in Scotland and we support the companies that are part of that. Absolutely. That's great. <clears throat> yes, Professor Caden. We also need a little bit more clarity around, you know, what, what the bank will be investing in and the quantums of investment it will be doing. So, for example, um, I hear indications that the bank won't invest anything less than a million uh, into a particular company. However, you know, if we look at the business base in Scotland, 77% um, um, of the 98% of the SMEs are actually micro businesses, you know, under 10 employees. They're not looking for a million pounds, you know, investment. So how are we going to fund the different stages of the business growth journey of earlier stage businesses? Whereupon, you know, sometimes, you know, the amount of capital that they actually need is maybe 25,000, which is completely transformational for them. Uh, they're maybe not looking for a million. So I think we need a little bit more clarity around this area. All right. Thank you. And uh, before perhaps we get into discussions about whether whiskey is good for the health of the nation or not, I think we're out of time. So thank you very much to our panel for coming in today. And I'll suspend the session briefly to allow changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Welcome back, and we continue looking at the Scottish National Investment Bank, um, and we have with us now Matt Lancashire, Director of Policy and Public Affairs at SEDI. Welcome to you. Flora Hamilton, Director of Financial Services, CBI, and again, welcome. And last but not least, Helen Martin, Assistant General Secretary of the Scottish Trade Union Congress, so welcome to you as well. Um, if I could just start uh, with a question I put to the last panel and see what your views are on this. Um, a lot of the submissions that we received uh, were of the view the broad mandate set out by the bill um, on the bank's main and ancillary objects failed to enshrine either the Scottish Government's version or of the vision for the bank as set out in its implementation plan uh, or indeed the socio-economic and environmental objectives that were expected by some from the consultation process. Um, are you satisfied with the objects and would you categorise them as a bit vague, open to interpretation as some have or do you think they're fine as they stand? Who would like to go first? Helen Martin. Yeah, I'll kick off on that. Um, I think we would like to see more of the sort of ethical and social ethos coming through in the objects of the bank. Um, I think, you know, object one, for example, <coughs> talks about promoting or sustaining economic development or employment in Scotland. It doesn't seem like a big change to say, or fair work in Scotland, or even, or quality employment in Scotland, which gives more of a sense of that kind of, um, need for it not just to be about jobs, but to be about the, the right sort of jobs and, and um, the sort of fair work approach that the Scottish Government has been developing and working on. I also do think it's right to see the kind of ethical um, commitment put up front as, as, a, as an end in itself. Um, otherwise, you can get bogged down in kind of very narrowly defined economic objectives that feel to see that kind of wider social benefit that is required and that was a core reason for developing the bank in, in the first place. Um, I do also wonder about um, the balance of the mission oriented approach and, and where the missions kind of fit in um, to the, the core ethos of, of the bank. It wasn't clear to me um, the status that those missions would have if they were additional to the core focus or if they were if they were the core focus in and of themselves so I guess the question in my head was can you invest in things that don't fit the missions because they fit wider economic growth um, priorities or is it about delivering the missions and that was that wasn't clear from from what I looked at um, I, I would um, add to that comment that I think it's absolutely crystal clear to look at the, if the vision of the bank is to prov as a catalyst for pro private investment to achieve growth in the Scottish economy, then I think th the objects really need to clarify the three roles of the investment bank, which is investment across early stage, investment for scale up companies and then the mission-led long-term patient capital investment that's need to tackle the societal challenges in Scotland and therefore the objects need to cover all of those um, and, and so that focus and, and flexibility and wide scope is what we would say is key to deliver that growth in the Scottish economy. Um, yeah, um, I think I, I agree with what Moses has been said. Um, previously on this. I think that the three objectives of the banks though, re remain quite clear and distinct, which is to remove barriers to patient capital, equity finance in terms of venture capital. That's got to be one of the purposes of the bank to support increasing productivity and the relatively low levels of innovation and R&D and investment. Now, if that R&D and investment is connected to ethical or low carbon or environmental aspects of innovation that's fantastic but we can't just look exclusively at those types of investments as well as a broad industries and sectors out there across many different organizations that also need long patient capital to increase our productivity as well and it's all got to be linked back to that we talked about outcomes in the last session but one of the outcomes is increasing our low levels of productivity and could we actually sit here and say that will just be done through investing in low carbon, um, healthy ageing and, and whatever the other 
mission, I forget the last mission of the, of the bank, but the fourth one I'd like to add to that, probably what we'll come on to later, is around the fourth industrial revolution in terms of where is the investment across sectors, in terms of uh, data, in terms of robotics, in terms of software engineering, all the different aspects that are upon our economy, upon our global economy right now, where could we add an extra mission that encompasses a range of sectors on the fourth industrial re revolution that will lead us to increasing productivity, innovation, et cetera, as well. Thank you. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I'm a little bit unclear from uh, Flora Hamilton, your uh, answer to the Convener there about how you see the, the what, what you see as the main purpose of the bank, because the bill provides that the main object um, of the bank shall be set out in its Articles of Association, and that main object is giving financial assistance to commercial activities for the purpose of promoting or sustaining economic development or employment in Scotland. As things stand at the moment, that is what is proposed to be the main object of the bank. And if that uh, passes into law, that has to be the main object. Do you agree with that object, or do you think it should be phrased differently? No, we would agree, uh, CBI members would agree with that object. What I'm trying to clarify is the different roles that will fall off fr b from that object in that where the bank's activities could be placed as laid out in the implementation plan is that by focusing to tackle the productivity challenges in the Scottish economy, you need to look at three distinct buckets of activity, and that is funding going into entrepreneurial businesses at startup stage, funding going into scale up those mid-tier businesses where real economic growth lies, and then you will have your long-term demand for patient your cap your demand for long-term patient capital to go into those projects that are sitting within the specific missions that have been outlined for the bank. There's three missions that have been identified around the Scottish Scotland becoming carbon neutral by 2045. That's a distinct potential mission that's been outlined and clearly there's a government target set against that. So that is about the long-term missions and they're quite distinctive from what you need to do, the investment that needs to go into scale-up growth. We had in the previous section, session um, an example of Scottish investment in Scottish whisky. That is about going in to fund growth where jobs and prosperity lie in communities across Scotland. So there's a st uh, we see a distinct difference in those three roles of the bank. Okay, okay, that's, that, that's of some assistance, I think. Um, Mariana Mazzucato last week, um, in evidence to us, um, stressed the fact that, of course, one of the main roles of, Scot of uh, national investment banks is to be able to provide patient capital to innovation, for example, innovation that will often not be funded by the private sector, and an innovation which, uh, in, in, in the years to come, is often relied upon by the private um, sector. So I'm just wondering um, about the word commercial activities. This is central, giving financial assistance to commercial activities. Do you think the term commercial activities uh, fully expresses the range of, poten of the, 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 the full potential of the Scottish National Investment Bank, given that some of the things that have been invested in by the state in the past, the kind of technologies were never, ever commercial for years and years and years and years and years, until one day the private sector began to turn them into commercial opportunities. Um. I mean, I think this just talks to the heart of the tension of the bill. I think there is, within this entire project, an, an element of tension about what is the long-term aspiration in terms of patient capital and what is the sort of short-term um, sort of requirements in terms of supporting growth companies and innovation in, 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 in society. And, I mean, I think we're building it in this contradiction in some ways and how the bank has functioned in a whole variety of ways and that would be one of our key concerns. So for example, um, it says that it must become self-financed in 10 years. Well, that means that you will have to have growth returns within the medium term in five years in order to um, secure that kind of long-term health of the bank going forward to provide patient capital. So my question would be, how do you ensure that uh, the patient capital elements of the bill are getting the same kind of attention as that first order requirement to invest in things that are producing returns to meet the financial requirements that are laid down for, for the bank to begin with to operate. So I think that's one of the elements that for us is kind of concerning about how this 
is is being set up and i think the the issue that you raised about you know focusing on what things that are commercial things that provide those returns things that um look promising and give you um something to write in your five year um report back to parliament about the success of the bank i mean to a certain degree that uh, acts as a, as a break on doing what the bank is actually supposed to do, which is correct the market failure that exists, um, the sort of disincentives that other banks have in actually supporting these kind of long-term, slow-growth things that aren't aren't obviously beneficial in economic terms, but have but unlock greater economic um, opportunities for the Scottish economy in the long term. That's that's kind of the purpose of it, and I think, unfortunately. As much as the aims in the implementation plan were things that we could get behind and as much as we support the Scottish National Investment Bank, I do think that there are elements of this bill where that just hasn't been fully thought through and fully bottomed out yet at this point. I, I think it's um, really important to, to, to take into consideration the importance of the bank being able to crowd in investment. That is how you're going to tackle the, the, the need for long-term patient capital to tackle some of those mission-led investments that, that are required in the Scottish economy is by the crowding in. By the Scottish National Investment so, Bank... So what do you mean by crowding in? Crowding in. By the no Scottish National Investment Bank acting as the cornerstone investment in a big, long-term project, it will attract in private investment. There's parts of, of the Scottish economy that cannot attract in that private investment as it stands on its own. Do you have but, some ex examples of that? Um, I don't have any examples to hand, but I can certainly provide you with, with some of those. But if you have a cornerstone investment coming from a national investment bank, then you will attract in that private capital. I guess a good example would be some of the urban regeneration programmes that have happened across the UK, where you have... Um, UK headquartered investors such as Legal and General or Hermes Investment Management going into places like Cardiff and Leeds and King's Cross and they go in and they provide the cornerstone investment and then they will attract in Australian pension funds or Canadian pension funds and that's what you do. You can bring in those private institutional investors that will give you that long-term growth. They're pension funds. They need long-term investments that give them steady, reliable income in the long term. They're not looking to make a return on their investment in the short term. And that's why I come back to this very clear distinction. It may seem complicated, but the bank is going to have to meet a number of different requirements in the short, mid-term and long term. It's looking to service the looking to service the Scottish economy in its short term, medium term and long term. And and therefore it will need that complexity within its objects. Um, just to just to add to Flora more, more so than anything, it is about that crowding in of funding and examples of that are in terms of Germany and the KFW uh, operate uh, mechanisms in that way as well as the Japanese uh, finance corporation that run a similar institution as well. So there are global examples of where national investment banks or something similar have been used as a cornerstone to pull public finance but also private sector investment together in terms of long-term patient capital. And, and surely that's the objective of long-term patient capital and the bank is that it does make a return on investment, not just for the bank but for the Scottish economy and Scottish society as a whole, or else what's the point? That is the point in terms of where it where it needs to head in, in the long term and in the future as well. And I think successful national investment banks like the KFW, and I know the Scottish National Investment Bank will be nowhere near the same size as the KFW and what they can do is that it supports and drives innovation by correcting market failures and creating new markets. And surely that's the objective for the National Investment Bank is to create these new markets for Scotland that keeps our economy competitive, keeps us exporting through the new trading nation strategy and, and pushes our economy forward so we can all enjoy that inclusive growth that we so wish to drive forward to. And examples of that have been transformative technologies in interventions in nanotechnology, telecommunications, renewable, renewable energy that investment banks have put long-term patient capital in around the globe, and that's where we need to drive that commercial activity. Okay, just two small questions to finish off. Um, firstly, under Section 11 on the setting of the missions, the missions 
um, are to be set by ministers in a document um, that describes the socio-economic challenges the bank seeks to address. That's the provision made in the bill for the setting of the missions. Uh, do you think that those missions should be subject to parliamentary scrutiny and approval? That's the first question. And secondly, do you think the membership of the bank should be restricted to Scottish ministers? Or do you think there should be a role, for example, for local authorities to have um, membership of the bank as well? As is the case with KFW. Again, because it seemed the, the first question. Ellipse, sorry, sorry, the first yes, question yes. is about the missions. Yeah. So Scottish ministers are to set the missions of the bank in a document describing the socio-economic challenges the bank seeks to address. Mm -hmm. There's no provision in there for Parliament to scrutinise and debate and approve those missions. There is provision in Section Two for the Parliament to have to approve any changes in the bank's objects and articles of association. Mm -hmm. That has to be done. Mm -hmm. There's no provision for Parliament to have any say whatsoever in what those missions are. So I'm just wondering, do you think that Parliament should have a role in, for example, approving by resolution of Parliament the mission? And then the second question is about membership, a different question. So I think it's been, been stated that the Scottish Government will not have a role in internal governance or day-to-day -day operational decision-making of the bank itself. Oh, sure. And I think that's, that's been emphasised before. I think where we've emphasised is the importance of operational independence of the bank being enshrined in legislation. And but clear. what I'm talking about is the setting of the missions for the bank by its sole shareholder, Scottish ministers. I'm just asking you... Well, the advisory group will give advice to the Scottish ministers upon those missions. And yes, I'm just asking, should Parliament have a role? in debating and approving those missions, or should Parliament have no role at all? We, we don't have a position on that at okay. SCDI, but I'm, I'm trying to give you a broader answer no, in, 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 in terms enough. of that. We, CBI members have not expressed an opinion yeah. on those particular okay. points. Yeah, we have a view. Um, we <laughs> absolutely think that Parliament should have a role. I mean, this is about two billion pounds of public money um, this is about supporting the strategic direction of the Scottish economy and it's about um, supporting you know the sort the type of growth that we want to see in the economy which should be inclusive which should promote fair work which should be um, delivering a low carbon future and I kind of think that it's actually really important that there's a proper democratic oversight of high of the missions that this bank is um, set to go and go away and work on um, I actually think that just debating the missions is the absolute minimum that the Scottish Parliament should be doing, actually. I mean, I do think that there is something about how the bank has been, um, again, how the bank has been set up very narrowly to only invest in the private sector. I think when you then put, it, put a mission in that says, OK, we want to see a low carbon future, um, sending a bank off to only um, invest in the private sector get, to get that low carbon future might in fact lead you in a certain direction about how infrastructure is developed or how in infrastructure is provided across the country because that, that money can only flow to the private sector in a way that is perhaps not what Parliament necessarily would have wanted to do if, if, um, if it had been left to its own devices. And I do wonder if you know, there needs to be slightly more oversight of some of the decisions that might flow from, from this just because of the very narrow drawing of, of what the bank is able to do. Um, and to your second question on should Membership. there be a role for local authorities, I think absolutely there should be. Um, I think it's right that one of the things that we're really very um, interested in in this element is where is the community voice within this bank? Um, Scottish ministers play a vital role and I think it's good to see them as shareholders but putting in that wider community perspective of local authorities would be a good start. I don't think it's the beginning or the end of the conversation but I think that would that would help broaden out the perspective of um, what, the, what the bank would be tasked to do and how the missions would be delivered and I think that would be useful. Do, do either of the other two of you have any views on whether the, member, the shareholders should be extended beyond Scottish ministers or left just as Scottish ministers? I, th I think we've supported that Scottish ministers will set the strategic direction of the bank, so that in itself answers the question for me there. So they should be the sole shareholder? The, the Scottish government should be the, yeah, the, the sole shareholder in the yes. bank, yeah. In your view, it should? Well, I, I think it we've, should, uh, yeah. Okay. 
got clear enough answers to these questions. Uh, now, uh, I'll turn to Dean Lockhart. Thanks, Convener. I'd like to come back briefly to the question of uh, stimulating demand in the economy for the additional financing, because we're seeing a much larger scale of financing which is going to be available. If you look at the Scottish Growth Scheme, for example, there was insufficient demand from business to take up funding from, from that scheme. Um, we've spoken to the bank, and the bank doesn't see its own role as being the originator or it doesn't see its role in identifying the businesses to finance, the bank will rely on existing enterprise agencies for that job. So my question is, do the existing enterprise agencies therefore have to uh, significantly change the way they operate uh, in order to find the businesses to, to access this finance? Um. Whether they significantly need to operationally change is probably not one question I should answer. Maybe the uh, chief execs and chairs of the enterprise agencies might be a better, give a better answer. Yeah, absolutely. If, if, if there is a case to stimulate demand and there have been issues in other programmes and other initiatives before, it makes sense that the agencies should work with partners, uh, both from uh, business member organisations to academia, where you will find a lot of this innovative thinking and knowledge happening, but also not forgetting uh, regional approaches as well in terms of regional economic groups that can support driving that demand and activity. So yeah, there is some argument that they will need to probably put more focus on that. How they do that, I suppose, is, is, is entirely up to them in terms of their thinking. But if we do want this to be a success, it will be based on how many people want to drive through, uh, identify, and, and ultimately fund the innovations and the patient capital needed and across a range of business activities. So demand is uh, massively important for it. We're at a, a very, very critical time in terms of demand for, 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 for growth finance. Business investment is currently at an all-time low right across the UK with the uncertainty of Brexit hanging over us. Um, it will be critical for the bank to work with the enterprise agencies to map out what their roles, to collaborate fully and to understand where they can stimulate, where, where the stimulus for de demand can come. Um, it'll be very, very important to do very detailed segmentation analysis of where demand can lie. I think one of our previous um, um, experts on, on, on the panel was talking about the very low level of, of um, ambition for growth in SMEs across, uh, across Scotland. Um, there is a very, very high percentage of, of firms that have no ambition to grow. What is critical is to work around a cluster structure. Clusters bring together organisations where you can, where you can st as well as attracting in private investment, you can also help to stimulate demand by having peer experience of particular type of finance delivering where you can share success and you've got, you know, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs getting together and showing these success stories and by going through that cluster approach you can start to, to stimulate demand. There's distinct ways in doing it, but firstly is to identify where there is ambition for growth and then where there is opportunity for growth and trying to build that ambition around it to stimulate that demand. But I think given where we are in these times of heightened geopolitical risk, we are going to work, have to work very hard to collaborate and stimulate demand. Um, I think we would agree with that. I think one of the missions that uh, was a sort of place-based mission, and I think if you think about it from that point of view, you might need to do quite a lot of work to stimulate demand across, a, in, a, in a coherent and holistic way, across a sort of community, and that might mean working with a whole range of partners from the enterprise agencies, local authorities, which, you know, again, gives weight to why having local authorities as shareholders within the bank is an important thing. Um, and uh, I think it's important to work with civic society organisations um, and trade unions in that respect as well, and to see this as part of the wider sort of social partnership model that we're trying to create here. This is about um, not simply but driving growth within small SMEs. It's about it's about driving shared prosperity within communities, and I think it's about trying to develop that sort of shared stake within society. Um, that we don't have a lot of actually so I think the bank could provide a bit of because it, it brings money and it brings a, an, an opportunity for investment it brings something to, to sort of coalesce around in a wider way for, for other stakeholders. 
Okay, thanks very much. The other question I had was on corporate governance. We, we've heard that the Scottish ministers can change the mission of the bank without any parliamentary oversight or uh, discussion. That's also the case. The Scottish ministers don't need to consult or agree, get agreement by the board of directors or the advisory board. There, there's no qualification there. Based on your experience of other forms of corporate governance, do you think that unfettered power of Scottish ministers is a sensible uh, allocation of responsibility? No. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, I think there, there are other examples of Scottish ministers having some oversight and then, um, you know, other layers of governance underneath that, you know, for example, in the university sector. Um, and the, what, what we find is that there does need to be some je checks and balances within the system. So I think, you know, the role of Parliament here is crucial. I think Parliament play, is a really important democratic institution and it should have um, the right to consider, amend, vote on the missions of the bank. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, um, you know, there, there should also be some um, element of consultation with the advisory group. Why have an advisory group if you're not going to consult them? Um, and with the, with the governors within the bank as well. Thank you. I, I think... The CBI believes that the, the, the role of the advisory group is absolutely critical and, and advising back in. The board will be accountable to, to, to Scottish Government for the delivery of the bank. And, and the advisory group has got to be a very, very, has got to be comprised of a very, very broad spectrum, has got to be that independent, clear and transparent monitoring of the performance of the bank and how it's delivering against a very, very set of, of tangible and measurable KPIs. That's absolutely got to be clear. But the advisory group really has got to come across, has got to be a wide perspective from across the Scottish economy and Scottish society. We've got to have, you've got to have business representation on there. You've got to have, rep have representation for the financial services world. You need your universities. You need your, your respected Scottish think tanks. You, you need to have your, your, um, your uh, initiatives such as Scottish Enterprise. These, in, these all need to be on there, advising there. CBI would also advise um, to look for international expertise. This is, um, there's plenty, um, there's, there's, you know, look to other international, um, national investment banks, particularly those within the EU. That is something that Scottish Government can tap into and make that advisory board work and deliver for the Scottish Government. Yeah, I, I agree on the importance of the advisory board and, and we're on record as emphasising the need for the operational independence of the bank. and. I think that's critical to be enshrined in legislation and respected by all parties once the institution is established and operational. Um, and if you want it to last long term, <laughs> I think that's one of the most critical routes. Whoever's in power then is it, it, just enshrined from <laughs> anyone <laughs> doing what it wants with uh, the, the, the investment bank moving forward, which is critical to itself. It needs to be able to offer loans, make investments, agree joint ventures, create subsidiaries, align with agreed investment strategies and risk strategies without further approval from ministers. And that is how you'll make a success of, of, of the bank. Okay. Thank you. Jackie Bailey. Brief area to explore with you, and that's the financial memorandum, which said that the bank will lend solely to the private sector. Um, at, some witnesses have obviously said that that was quite narrow and restrictive. I wonder whether you think it should be a much more open approach, lending indeed to the third sector, community enterprises, and so on. And I start with Helen Martin, who's nodding vigorously. Yeah, well, I, I find this a very, a very restrictive provision when you then l overlay the missions that the bank has. So, you know, one of the things that the implementation plan talks about is about transport infrastructure, and it's about um, the development of low-carbon transport infrastructure, to be specific. So, you know, you take, for example, charge points of electric vehicles. That was the example used in the implementation plan. Those are primarily developed at present by the public sector and are held in the public sector. 
So, you know, if you are tasking an investment bank to go away and develop low-carbon electric vehicle infrastructure and then saying, but you can only do it by investing in the private sector, then you are changing dramatically the model that currently exists and you are bringing in, um, you know, market forces into what will be a key part of infrastructure that will underpin our economy going forward. Equally, it's a very cluttered landscape transport at the minute and there's a lot of different types of providers. So you are creating a situation where you would be saying, okay, you can support first bus to develop um, you know, low carbon buses, but you couldn't support Lothian buses. You're supporting um, Serco to, de to develop their, their ferries in a low carbon way, but you can't support CalMac. You, there's a whole range of sort of contradictions within that um, mission and the, the, the kind of limiting the public sector. And then it's difficult to draw the line of where the public sector begins and ends as well. Um, so you have, for example, a company like Bifab, which is a strategic asset in the low carbon economy, but the Scottish government is a shareholder. So could this investment bank invest in Bifab or could it not? Um, equally, you've got something like uh, the Springburn Rail Depot, for example, which is currently under threat and which um, could do with investment to electrify the line to secure the future of that, of that portfolio. But it would probably be for either ScotRail or for Network Rail that that investment would be done. So it's currently in private hands, but it would be put to the public if that investment was done. So would the Scottish Investment Bank be in a position to make that investment for the benefit of the public sector or not? And that... Those are the sorts of questions that I think putting a rule like that into, in, in for the bank creates a lot of unnecessary questions about how you can invest, when you can invest, who you can work with, how you can draw the capital in. For example, universities in the CBI submission, you talked a lot about the need to work with universities. But universities are public sector, are they not? They incubate a lot of businesses as well, startup businesses, high growth potential businesses perhaps. Are you saying that the Scottish National Investment Bank can't work in, with, those, with those businesses because they're also associated with the university? Uh, it's not clear to me. I mean, perhaps some of these questions could be sorted out. Some of these, we could provide clearer guidance. But I think the way it is constructed at the minute, it does raise serious question marks for, for how the bank will work and how it will achieve the strategic missions that we're, we're giving it as well. Yes, I, th I think um, Helen raises some very valid points. I think what we're touching upon here is some of the structural issues around the setting up of the bank. You know, um, there, are, there are implications under EU um, state aid rules. There are implications under fiscal rules, government fiscal rules. So that's what you're touching on here. Um, so I think... The CBI calls for the widest possible scope to be given to the to the set to the to the National Investment Bank um, in order for it to achieve its objectives. So it is it is it is essentially looking around how you can stretch what is private investment and where it touches on it. And it is a very very complex landscape. Um, but it, it is going to be one of the challenges that the bank will face, is that it's not impinging on those rules as to how it's funding, because it impacts on how it goes and raises its capital. I'm not sure that's the case, but I'll come back to you in, in a second. Matt Lancashire. Yeah, um, I think it, it, it does go back to needing further clarity on what the bank and certain sectors, sectors it can invest in I mean, that's private, public, or a range of different sectors, and what does ethical actually mean as well? And I think that's where the bill lacks real clarity right now, and that needs, to, I think, be offered some clarity before it becomes fully operational. In the, in the broadest sense, it'd be, I don't just want to take public sector, but it, it is a massive part of our economy, a massive part of our society, so we have to take a look at it. Is there's plenty of innovation that happens across the public sector that could be commercialised in terms of any way to different sectors and forms. So it would make sense for that opportunity to widen the scope out to public sector organisations. But we've not had the clarity in the bill yet to, to make a call on that as such, to, to, to move that discussion forward. It does worry about the universities because they are play a massive part in, in our R&D and innovation structure in Scotland. 
where to their involvement, how do they progress forward their innovations. We all know that they're great. We're great at coming up with ideas and, and, and such so, but we're not the best at commercialising those ideas. So where is the connection with the investment bank and the R&D knowledge that's coming out of universities as well? And they are part of the public sector. So we, again, I just think that part of the bill needs more cl clarity and so we can all make a more um, considered uh, response to the question, yeah. Jackie. No, that, that, that's very helpful. The reason I come back to state aid is I, never in my knowledge is a community enterprise being funded um, being a matter of state aid. So, so I think it's principally because the government is only capitalising this at the beginning with financial transaction money. That's a choice they're making. They could choose to provide additional capital that they have increased borrowing limits for themselves that would give that wider scope um, you know, much more prominence and, and allow the kind of you know, innovation based roundabout universities to be funded too. You, how you how you bring that together exactly. and it's about how you channel channel the funding in the particular ways yeah okay thank you convener john mason uh, thanks convener um i mean the advisory group has been mentioned already and some of you have made comments about it can i just ask you how you see the relationship between the advisory group and the board of the bank i mean would it be good or bad for example to have a person for example the chair of the advisory group actually on the board as well Ms. Martin. Um, yes, I think um, the governance of the bank is very important because I think, um, as Matt rightly said earlier, you know the bank is going to be independent of government. It's going to be given its missions that hopefully will be democratically decided, and then it's going to go away and work on that. So um, I would want to see the bank's um, governing body being um, well well designed that it has um, you know good governance principles at its heart and for me good governance principles means that you would have representatives of um, of of wider interests within within that structure so from our point of view we would see the case for worker seats on the board for that for that purpose but I would also think that it would be appropriate to have someone from the wider advisory council also sitting on the board because it gives that broader perspective it gives that um, it it could therefore reflect the the sort of wider discussion that the advisory group has had, which would have a mixture of civic society organisations, businesses, universities, the sorts of people that have already been kind of mentioned, trade unions again, in their kind of broader mm. role. You don't think that um, would compromise the advisory group if they were kind of partly involved in decision making? No. 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 Um, and we, this is a question we get put a lot in, in trade union land because we debate it endlessly. Should trade unions be involved in, in you know, s sit on boards, be involved in the decision? Decision making when they're also then potentially like challenging the decisions of of, of the employer, say, mm. and we have decided, I think, um, pretty much at this point, that it is worth being involved in that decision making and having that um, clear ability to shape and um, really participate in truly as an equal in those decisions. And it is a much, much different relationship than just simply offering someone advice. And it wasn't hugely clear whether you were offering advice from the advisory group to the minister or to the, to the board of governors. And I think actually the advisory group should be um, for the for the, for both really, um, and I think having a member of the advisory group on the board would, along with um, a, a worker seat, would be a really um, important way of bringing that wider perspective in. Okay, thanks. Just before I bring the other two in, if they want, um, the, the suggestion was made in the previous panel as well that the articles of association should mention the advisory group, which is it's not on the board. It's not in the bill. Uh, but the preference, at least of one witness, was that it should be in the Articles of Association. So maybe you could just comment if you think that's where it should be as well. Ms Hamilton? Yeah, I think it would make good sense <coughs> that it does sit in the Articles of Association. Um, we haven't debated that in detail at the CBI, but, but having listened to the previous session, it would make good sense if the advisory board is to have a role of feeding back in, giving independent monitoring and advice in, 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 into Scottish Government, then, 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 it, then it, would, it would make sense for it to sit in the Articles of Association and to have uh, be identified as fulfilling that role. Um, we haven't debated at length um, whether um, the members of the Advisory Board could also sit on the main board. Um, I would, 
I would advise that, that there is a look at um, international practice in this and look at what other regulated bodies are doing um, to look to see if, if that is appropriate and to understand the sort of the, the two distinct roles of the advisory group mm. and the board. Um, it, it, I, it would be probably ha have, have a look at how other regulated bodies in the UK are tackling that. Thank you. Mr. Langshaw? Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to comment whether someone's going to sit on the board or not, but I'm going to comment on what the perception of the advisory group okay. is. And, and I think that can then play a part in greater people than I deciding that as, as well. Um, I think the advisory group has been set up to provide intelligence analysis of emerging and future trends, challenges and opportunities in society, the labour market, the wider economy to advise on the creation or amended missions of the bank, and most crucially, to identify growth sectors which require patient capital. And it's meant to be an independent advisory group. So take that from that what you will. Okay. <laughs> so if you're advising where to invest yeah. and all of a sudden you're making the decision yes. on where to invest, yeah. that, you know, they could... Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, get, I get that point. And I've, I've, uh, Ms. Martin yeah. has... Uh, you want to come in again, Ms. Martin? Uh, yes, yeah, sir. I just wanted to add one further point about the, the bill article association issue. Um, I think it would be appropriate, actually, to put it into the bill. Um, we ha There is precedence for this. I mean, the um, SQA, for example, has a board structure and an advisory group structure, um, which you could kind of look to as a, as a model. And on that particular structure, the board, the, uh, the member of the board chairs the advisory group. And it's kind of seen that that mm. way round, okay. if you know right. what I mean, but okay. you could That's, a, that's a helpful that example, thanks. I, yeah. I'm, the convener's chasing me to ask my Sorry. questions quickly, so uh, I'd better move on. The other area I wanted to touch on was kind of financial side of things. Uh, Capitalisation, I mean, I think most of our witnesses have said they feel the £2 billion is a reasonable level, um, but if any of you think it's not, please tell me. And the, But the other area would be around costs and how quickly the, the bank should break even. Uh, the previous panel seemed to think it was a little bit quick to do that by 20. 22, 23, that kind of level, and kind of some of the costs that have been linked in the financial memorandum. So, if possible, reasonably brief points or answers on that. Ms. Hamilton, any thoughts? Um, in, it, 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 it looks incredibly tight, <coughs> um, but um, possibly possibly do, do, doable. But but what is is very important is 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 for there to be a a level of patience and a level of understanding that this is for a long this is for a mid to long term investment to drive growth in the scottish economy and therefore it's not going to be a quick fix mm -hmm. and it's not going to quickly get to um to, to to sort of balancing out on its costs but i mean presumably also we can't just keep pouring revenue exp uh, expenditure absolutely. into the bank year absolutely. after year. Absolutely. There is a very good model to look at, I mean, in, in the UK, to look at the British Business Bank and how that's been set up. There are good models to, to, to look at this. It cannot, it cannot be um, a burden on, on the Scottish finances, but um, it, it also needs to be that um, there needs to be an understanding that it will take some years be, um, for the bank to get up and to, to be able to come and meet its costs and deliver return on investment, because part of its function is on mission-led long-term patient capital, and it can't be over-reliant on the other two roles, which is the scale-up and the start-up financing. And if you push it in that direction, then that will temper the nature of the bank. So patience will be required. But it is, it is ambitious, okay. but possibly doable. Thanks. Mr Lancashire, politicians should be more patient than they usually are. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> we can always call for that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think $2 billion, we've welcomed that. I think that's a, it's, a, it's a good effort. It's 1.3% of GDP in comparison to other, other countries. That's higher than that, that they put into their own investment banks. Admittedly, they've got much bigger economies and, and, and more money to invest there. I think where our concern lies in that is that that 1.3 percent of GDP won't be reached to 2030. So, if the, the economic changes here now and the vision that we all want to transform the economy in the next couple of years, that might be difficult to achieve before 2030. So, I think just looking at that a little bit might be helpful. So, I think their scale and speed are required quickly on the 2023-24. Everyone keeps saying it's tight, so I'll say it's tight. But actually, that's reliant on people. 
And, and I think we heard in the other session that people have got to be mission orientated and altruistic towards the mission. But there's a war on talent in financial services, hence why the wages are through the roof, hence why we struggle in terms of different financial services companies getting their talent that they need in Scotland. So I think a real close look on what are the, the talent expertise needed uh, up to 2023-24 to make the operational bank operational and move forward is quite critical because, as I said, there's a global war on financial services. I think someone else will ask about remuneration, yeah, so yeah. we'll come back to that one. Uh, Okay, oh, you want to come in, Ms Martin, as well? Uh, well, just to echo the, the point about the patient finance, I think that's that's really important and does need more consideration because I think right now, as the bank is, um, up is created, the balance is very much towards um, the, the shorter-term elements. Uh, the other question is, is there not a way to leverage in more money, primarily just to allow you to invest in different things? Um, so it, it goes back to the point about it being restricted to the private sector only because of the, the transaction cost. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Angela Constance. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, the panel will have heard from earlier discussion that organisations such as Engender and Close the Gap have some rather substantial concerns about the equality impact assessment. Um, and I just wondered uh, whether uh, any of the panel members um, here just now had any concerns about the quality impact assessment. Ms. Martin. Uh, um, it, I mean, it, it wasn't extensive, <laughs> so I think I think that there was an element of um, more thinking, perhaps required. I think there was a lot of there was a lot of ground covered in it in some ways, um, because it started to talk about the need to put in fair work and fair work first, which we really welcome and we think is absolutely essential. It also talked about the need to follow the human rights guide and principles, which I think are. Um, in, for business, which I think are really, really important as well. But it did raise a lot of questions for me about, particularly around human rights guiding principles, about where the expertise would come for the bank in that respect, um, because that is quite uh, a, a technical and important piece of legislation that could be used to great effect, actually, to follow the ethical mission, um, if there was a good understanding of what it really meant to meet those guiding principles. Okay. And Ms Martin, do you have any concerns about uh, equality um, not being uh, written into the, the, the face of the bill at all? Uh, yes, I think uh, that goes back to my first sort of answer around the objects of the bill, I think. I mean, having that sense of the wider sort of mission around equality, around support for, um, for communities um, and around sort of ethical investment, I think, is an element of this that, that is hugely important and that you know, fits well with the missions and would um, complement the missions that the, that the bank has but would be easily lost if it takes quite a short-term kind of high growth um, kind of approach within its, uh, within its work. Okay. I wondered if other members of the panel had any views about the quality impact assessment and whether or not it was uh, treated as a tick box exercise. Um, we, we haven't engaged with CBI members on that, but I, but I, I would like to, you know, point out that the CBI is calls on business to make diversity and inclusion across all areas of its organisation, and we've plenty of examples of where, di you know, uh, active diversity and inclusion policies will deliver real economic impact and I think we've all seen very recently the Rose Review looking at the lack of access to funding for female entrepreneurs across the UK and certainly one of the um, one, one of the e experts earlier um, gave a viewpoint on that. Um, I think it, it is it is very very I, th I think the bank could have um, could act on some of the recommended initiatives that are coming out of the Rose Review focusing in on, on female entrepreneurs um, as it is uh, as, as the statistics on funding that is getting to female entrepreneurs and female growth businesses is is, is quite shockingly low and the bank could have a, a very, very important role in addressing that, because by addressing it, we will also find further growth in the Scottish economy. Okay. Mr uh, Lancashire, do you have anything to add, or can we move on? Uh, j j just very ver very briefly, um, and it's similar to CBI, obviously, we, we champion diversity and inclusivity across all banking governance and, and operational structures, um, and, and we would move to support um, that being included um, as part of its operational standards and moving forward, that diversity and inclusivity. 
across its staff makeup, across its board, across its advisory group will only lead to better investment decisions uh, that certainly lead to a more inclusive society for Scotland. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, the committee has had um, mixed views uh, regarding remuneration policy. Um, on the one hand, uh, some people point to the fact that the bank will have to operate in the financial services sector. On the other hand, uh, people point to the fact that this will be a public body and uh, needs to be accountable to uh, taxpayers for, for value, for, for, for money. Um, so I would like to uh, ask each member of the, the, the panel their views on what uh, the specifics around the remuneration policy should be. Um, I'm happy to say one of the, the points that the CBI is, 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 is feels very strongly about is that the bank should be collaborating very closely with the British Business Bank for a number of different reasons. And this is one area where collaboration could deliver and help the Scottish National Investment Bank develop a successful people policy. Um, the British Business Bank has benefited and has managed to attract the right talent to make that bank a success and, and delivering, back, uh, delivering back to, to the UK government. And this is probably something where they'd be able to give very good tailored advice in that area. Mm -hmm. And the level of salaries in the British Business Bank is what, roughly? Has that caused any, uh, have there been any, for example, accusations of eye-watering salaries? No, there has been none that, I, that, that, we, that we are aware of. Okay, thank you. Mr Lancashire. I think ensuring that the bank is a great place to work, has a strong identity, a uh, good sense of mission, will support attracting talent within and beyond Scotland. I think that, 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 that's critically important. Mm. However, remuneration for senior leadership staff should be closely linked to the bank's performance. Uh, and I think that's critical too, in terms of you know, fair works pay for hard works done. You know, you've achieved your targets, you're, you should be justly rewarded for that as in any other role and job. I think the critical point is, is that we need to strike a delicate balance between the empowering the bank to attract talent through big wages, bonuses, etc., and retaining public trust in the bank and that perception. So there's a critical line there, what's too far and what's not. We want to get the right people, we want the right talent, we want the bank to be successful, and that's going to take decent remuneration packages, particularly when we're after leading economists, leading financial experts, etc., to be part of that bank as well. So how do we achieve that but still remain and have public trust after all the banking uh, discussions over the past 10 years around remuneration and salary packages and bonuses, etc.? Okay, Ms Martin. Um, I'm yeah. sure you'll have an answer to that question. <laughs> yeah. I think we're clear that um, it, it will have to apply public sector pay policy um, because it is a public sector institution. And um, it's not uh, reasonable to carve it out as a special case because you know financiers are somehow more important than other types of civil servants who do um, excellent jobs. And I would just add that um, you know fair remuneration is something that every employee should get, not just the senior leadership team. Um, what we would say, however, that is if there is a problem with applying public sector pay policy and attracting talent, then that is probably a wider question for the basis of public sector pay policy as a whole, rather than necessarily simply um, making a case for the Scottish National Investment Bank to have a, have, a, have a different approach, which I think would put in jeopardy public trust in the organisation, particularly given the issues in the banking sector more widely. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Finally, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I think a couple of the uh, panellists have actually <laughs> mentioned the word ethical and investment. Um, major investment banks and a lot of pension funds actually have lending exclusions, um, usually round about uh, investment into tobacco, which is a, which is a typical one, um, maybe greenhouse gas emissions or if the investment impacts negatively on biodiversity and ecosystem. Do you think that uh, the, in, the investment bank should follow an ethical lending policy? And if so, what would it be? Um, we CBI members don't have a list of, of lending inclusions that they would advise to, 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 
to the Scottish National Investment Bank. But but clearly, um, investments sh investments in in start up or scale up growth activities of the bank should not run con contrary to the activities of the bank that fall under its mission led patient capital investment work. I would um, I think what is important is that the bank is driven by um, sustainable growth. This is a very, very emerging important area coming into the financial services policy landscape. It is coming from the, um, in the saver, the investment community, where they are looking for their investments to be in products and ser at be in parts of the economy which can, which can satisfy environmental factors, social factors and good governance factors. So within the FS sector, the word, the, the, the big push at the moment is to find ESG investments and there's a lot of work going on at UK and at European level to look at how we can work towards sustainable investment because they are investments that will, will be resilient and long term and deliver in the long term. And, 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 and the pressure will come from the savers. The pressure will come from people who want their pensions to go into sustainable investments. So it's, it's, I think it's looking at it in that wider landscape. And therefore, the Scottish National Investment Bank will have to think about its own sustainable investment policy. I think this is linked back to the missions as such and, and ensuring those are legitimate and of high societal importance. Uh, and I think that that's already there in terms of we, we focus on low carbon, we focus on healthy ageing in, in the missions, focusing on um, inclusive growth as a as a three main drivers of missions. So it, all of those are ethical as such, and actually they they very much uh, copy KFW's approach, which is around climate change, globalisation, etc. as well. So there's a very model already there in terms of moving to a, a similar standard that other European countries are using as part of their um, banks as well. I think what we also said, we think that we are lacking an ethical mission around the fourth industrial revolution and what that means for people, jobs and the economy. How do we um, bring together all our different expertise and knowledge around the fourth industrial revolution to make this a real giant sector for the uh, Scottish economy and things like automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, big data, nanotechnology and biotechnology. I think that's a crucial mission that we're missing. But I go back to what I said earlier, early, I think it was to, to, to Jackie's question, um, what is what is ethical? Um, we need further clarity in the bill of what that what ethical is. What sectors are excluded and not um, before we can make any comment on on how you you judge something as ethical. It needs some kind of definition. Is what Do I'm you trying believe to... that definition should be within the bill itself? Well, I'm I'm, I'm not suggesting it should be within the bill, but it needs to find. <laughs> at some point along the line for people then to make a decision as to whether they agree with that standpoint or not. Uh, and at the moment, there's a lack of clarity around what is ethical, what sectors should we invest in or be allowed to invest in as, as the bank itself. And at the moment, that isn't clarified. So I think there's a bit of work around what that potentially is. Um, I think this is... This is really important to getting to the to the heart of what the, the the role of the bank is, and I think I would agree very strongly with Flora's comment about the idea that you, you you they should not the the bank should not be investing in in with its left hand in a way that undermines the missions of its right hand. I think you know those missions have to a certain degree, particularly around a low carbon future, they give you a sense of um, some of the exclusions that you might have within within your your investment portfolio, and it makes sense that it that be mainstreamed through the entire ethos of the bank, um, and that the missions sort of overlap and and there is some thought into how they they, they work together. So how do you create place based a, a proper place based approach in in a sort of similar way, and um, equally. You know, there, within the equality impact assessment, there was a sort of commitment to 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 fair work first and the principles of fair work first. And I think mainstreaming that kind of fair work commitment throughout the bank is really important, which is about creating 
quality and employment for, for workers across the economy. And that's something that, you know, should be at the heart of everything the bank does. Um, and equally, I think if you if you take the vein of the hu the the guiding principles for human rights, I mean that's another L uh, way of thinking about ethical investment that is already within some of the documentation around the bank. So there there is a lot of building blocks already there. I think it's just about putting the strategy around that, and um, understanding what that means um, if you're going to do it in a in a strategic and sustainable and coherent holistic way. Yeah. You know. The do you not invest in an oil and gas company who at this moment has is delivering carbon as such into into the environment when they come up with a solution for a low carbon technology that reduces carbon in the environment how do you judge that what what's the ethical how do you, could you exclude that because the a big oil and gas company or not and and i think we we need clarity on what that actually means because that i think that's a very dangerous step to take when we start to exclude businesses that might be transitioning or doing different things that need that investment that can really push our economy forward so while it's absolutely low carbon net zero etc but does that mean that we can't inv invest in mature industries and sectors that are looking to transition with the technologies and innovations that they've got and i think we need to be really careful about that in terms of the role of the investment bank Right. Thank you very much to our panel. Um, thank you for coming in today. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. If you want to write in further with further thoughts on some of the issues raised, then please do feel free to do so um, to the committee. So thank you very much. I'll suspend the meeting. We'll move into private session.